Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and I want to welcome you to another week in the New Testament, in the Scriptures. And this week, we're going to be covering the book of Hebrews, part two. Now, if you remember, last week I told you that I was going to cover the book of Hebrews in a little bit of a different way than the Come, Follow Me manual suggested. I've just decided to cover it in parts one and two. And so last week we discussed what I felt was the big overarching theme of the book of Hebrews. And that message was that the gospel of Jesus Christ is better than anything else. And therefore, we must be better because of that. This week in part two, we're going to focus in on some more detailed messages of this book of scripture. And as I said last time, one of the most compelling messages from the book of Hebrews is what Paul has to teach us about Jesus Christ. Hebrews is arguably Paul's most Christ-centered writing in the entire New Testament. So, if you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. And as an icebreaker and a means of turning your students' thoughts towards the Savior, you could encourage them to think about their favorite hymn or primary song about Jesus and to be willing to share why that is. And you may even decide to sing the first verse of some of those hymns that are mentioned by your students in class. Music can be a powerful way of inviting the Spirit into your classroom. And to help prompt their thinking, you could display the following slide that lists some of the more well-known hymns and primary songs about the Savior. Or, one other quick possibility here, if you like the idea of using music to introduce this theme of Christ's character, you might consider showing the following performance of How Great Thou Art. It's by the performing group, uh, the Bonner Family. And it's really, really well done. Uh, quite possibly my favorite performance ever of that particular hymn. It's just, it's so triumphant, it's so joyous, it's moving. And it's a great match for the message of Hebrews which is that Christ is better than anything else. How great thou art. It's a perfect companion piece to this book of Scripture. And this performance in particular, I really feel, nails that spirit. So I'll place a link to it in the video description below, and then just encourage you to watch it yourself um, by clicking on the link above right here. But with that as an introduction, let's see what Paul has to teach us about Jesus Christ. And one of the great things about Hebrews uh, is, is all the titles, the different titles that are given to Christ all throughout this book. And President Russell M. Nelson once said the following, If you proceed to learn all you can about Jesus Christ, I promise you that your love for him and for God's laws will grow beyond what you currently imagine. I promise you also that your ability to turn away from sin will increase. Your desire to keep the commandments will soar. You'll find yourself better able to walk away from the entertainment and entanglements of those who mock the followers of Jesus Christ. Study everything Jesus Christ is by prayerfully and vigorously seeking to understand what each of his various titles and names means personally for you. Did you catch all those promised blessings for learning all that you can about Jesus Christ? Our first task then will be to focus on some of those titles that President Nelson is encouraging us to study. And one way to review them could be by doing the following crossword puzzle activity. Invite your students to go through the identified scripture references and discover all of the different names that Christ is given throughout the book of Hebrews. Because as Hebrews chapter 1 verse 4 tells us, Christ has a more excellent name than any other. Now, if you're teaching adults and you prefer not to use a crossword puzzle for this, it's okay. You could just simply list all of the references that are in the crossword and uh, invite your class to identify each of the titles as they look them up. But here are the answers. To a cross. From Hebrews 2.10, Jesus is the captain of our salvation. For a cross, Hebrews 6.20, it says, 
the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus. Seven across, Hebrews 3.1. Jesus is the high priest of our profession. Eight across, from 1 verse 2. His son. Ten across, from chapter 1 verse 6. Jesus is the first begotten. Eleven across, Hebrews 12.2. The author and finisher of our faith. 13 across, Hebrews 3, 1, consider the apostle. Now to our our down clues. Uh, One down, Hebrews 13, 20, that great shepherd of the sheep. Three down, Hebrews 5, 6, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Five down, Hebrews 5, 9, the author of of eternal salvation. Hebrews 9.15, the mediator of the new covenant. 9 down, Hebrews 8.2, the minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. 12 down, Hebrews 9.11, a high priest of good things to come. Now, there's a final personal question down at the bottom of the handout that invites your students to consider which of those titles in that list is their favorite and why. Now, I found that contemplating the various titles of the Savior that we we find in the Scriptures to be a very eye-opening and faith-strengthening kind of activity, like President Nelson promised. Encourage your students to take a couple of quiet moments to really take that final question seriously. Which title deepens their understanding and love for the Savior most. And and here are a few brief thoughts of my own on each one of those titles. Jesus is the captain of our salvation. Now, a captain is typically a military advisor who offers leadership and command on our behalf. Or the captain is someone who directs or guides a vessel, such as a ship, or an airplane. Whichever way you look at it, it's important to ask ourselves if we have chosen Christ as our captain. Have we decided to get aboard his ship, his vessel? Do do we look to him for leadership and direction? If we are to wear the full armor of God, as Paul suggested back in Ephesians, we need a leader to follow into battle. We're soldiers. If we choose Jesus as that leader, he will most assuredly lead us to salvation and victory. Christ is the forerunner. A forerunner is somebody who goes before. Therefore, Christ has preceded us. But how? A couple of different ways. Uh, Jesus was the first created spirit of our heavenly parents, which is why we sometimes refer to him as our older brother. Also, he went before us to overcome death and sin. He marked the straight and narrow path that leads to salvation so that we could follow behind him. That's why he beckons, come, follow me. He's the ultimate example of how to live the best kind of life. And the title forerunner suggests that others will come after him. I guess we've got to decide if we are going to be a part of that number. Christ is the high priest of our profession, our profession of faith. A high priest was one that was anointed by God to offer sacrifice on behalf of the people. Well, Christ offered himself as that sacrifice and as the greatest high priest to ever live. If we place our faith in him, then his blood, his sacrifice, will atone for our sins. Christ is the Son of God. Son with a capital S. Because yes, we're all children of God, but but Christ is the Son of God. That denotes that He shares the same divine nature as the Father. And it clarifies Christ as a member of the Godhead and further underscores the depth of His condescension. From the highest of the high, He descended below all things. 
Christ is the first begotten. And in other places in Scripture, we see the title, the only begotten, in reference to Christ. What does that mean? Well, uh, we are all the product of two different sets of parents. Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother are the parents of our spirits, the eternal part of ourselves. Therefore, currently, we are all at least half divine. But then we also have an earthly father and an earthly mother who are the parents of our bodies, our mortal bodies. Those two halves together make us living souls, half divine, half temporal. The birth of Jesus Christ, on the other hand, was a little different. His spirit was also created by our Heavenly Father and our Heavenly Mother, but Heavenly Father was also Christ's earthly father, with Mary as his earthly mother. Therefore, Christ was three-fourths divine, to put it crudely. This is what made it possible for him to be our Savior. And this also made him the first and only begotten Son. That's what that means. Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. And those two titles go together. He's the author of our faith in the sense that he's the originator, the creator, the genesis of our faith. He's laid the foundation for it. Without him, our faith wouldn't exist. But he's also the finisher, the completer of our faith. He sustains it, helps it to grow, and bring it to its full maturity. And he is going to be the means by which we are ultimately perfected or completed or finished so that we can be made as he and God are. In other places in the scriptures, uh, uh, Christ is referred to as the Alpha and the Omega or the beginning and the end. Those are our two other titles for Christ that, that make the same point. He is an apostle. And we, we, we typically use the title of apostle to refer to those individuals that Christ called to accompany him to lead the church. But the title apostle itself also denotes someone who is a pioneering teacher or missionary, usually the first one to go into a specific country or place. Jesus fits that description too. He was the first teacher or missionary of the plan of salvation. We see him taking that role in the pre-mortal world. We see him taking that role in the Old Testament world, acting as Jehovah. And we see him taking that role in the New Testament as the initiator of the higher law and establisher of the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ truly was and is the original apostle. He is the great shepherd or the good shepherd. Now, we looked at that title in depth back in John chapter 10. But a shepherd is someone who cares for his sheep, leads them, feeds them, and protects them. Christ does the same for us. He is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. As members of the Church of Jesus Christ, the idea of divine authority is a really important one for us. Now, we believe that a man must be called of God by prophecy and by the laying on of hands by those who are in authority, to preach the gospel and to administer in the ordinances thereof. Well, Jesus is the originator of that authority. Doctrine and Covenants 107 verse 3 tells us that the actual name of the priesthood, the higher priesthood, is the holy priesthood after the order of the Son of God, Jesus. The reason we call it the Melchizedek Priesthood is because, well, Doctrine and Covenants 107, verses 2 and 4. Why the first is called the Melchizedek is because Melchizedek was such a great high priest. But out of respect or reverence to the name of the Supreme Being, to avoid the too frequent repetition of his name, they, the church, in ancient days, called that priesthood after Melchizedek, or the Melchizedek Priesthood. Well, Christ possesses and is indeed the source of that power and authority. 
Therefore, he's completely and perfectly authorized to lead and guide the church. Christ is the mediator. A mediator is someone who mediates or intercedes or negotiates between two parties that are at odds with each other. In this life, as we sin, we rack up a debt of justice that we simply cannot pay on our own. We can't meet the demands of justice without help, without a friend, without a mediator. Jesus acts as that mediator. He offers to pay the demands of justice for us so that mercy can be extended. And that doesn't mean that nothing is required of us. We have plenty still to do. But Christ makes it possible for us to receive grace at the hands of justice and for the debt to be paid. That's a profound principle. And if you, as a teacher, wish to really zero in on that relationship and that title, there's a great little seminary video called The Mediator that you might consider showing to your class. Uh, it depicts a little parable that makes this dynamic between justice and mercy and the role of the Savior in our salvation a lot easier to understand. It's very well done. So I'll put a link to, to it in the video description below if you're interested in focusing on that idea here. Christ is the minister of the sanctuary. In Old Testament times, priests were called on to minister the various ordinances of the sanctuary, or the tabernacle, in order to bring salvation to the children of Israel. But when Christ came, he became the minister of a different tabernacle, tabernacle of his body. And through the offering up of himself, he made salvation possible for all of us. He was the ultimate minister of the ultimate sanctuary. And, and I also just like the word minister, right? A minister is someone who attends to the needs of others. Christ does that. He, he ministers to our needs. He's a helper in time of need. And finally, Christ is a high priest of good things to come. If I had to choose... That would probably be my favorite one from that list. Jesus stands as the promise of good things to come. All about hope. All about future blessings. Even in our sufferings, our challenges, and our moral tests. Christ always stands as the promise of good things to come. And I'm fully convinced that heaven, or exaltation, will be worth any sacrifice or mortal anguish that we're required to endure here in this life. And if you want to focus on that title as a teacher, there's another wonderful church video that dramatizes a story that was told by uh, Jeffrey R. Holland in one of my favorite general conference talks of all time. In fact, that's the title of the talk and the video, A High Priest of Good Things to Come. And it's powerful. And I'll provide a link to that video in the description below as well. And that covers all of the titles, which I hope that was enlightening. This can be a really effective and meaningful classroom experience as you discuss those titles and what they mean personally to your students. I mean, just pondering each one myself to make this video was really was really a great exercise for me. It was it was edifying. Now, another aspect of the character of Christ that you could focus on from Hebrews is to examine some of the roles that Jesus Christ plays in God's plan. To do this, you could divide your students up into groups of four and assign each one a set of verses within that group. Their responsibility would be to study closely their assigned verses and decide which role from the following list is being described in their verses. And then they should be prepared to share what they learned about that role of Christ and, and why it's important uh, with the other three people in their group. So the assignments are, number ones, Hebrews 1, 2, 1, 10, and 2, 10. Number twos, Hebrews 1, 3, 1, 5, and 1, 13. Number threes, Hebrews 2, 17, 9, 28, and 10, 10 through 14. And number fours, Hebrews 2, 18, 4, 16, and 6, 18 through 19. 
and then the four possible roles that they could choose from? Are their verses describing Christ in his role as either a redeemer, a helper, creator, or a member of the God? So let's start with the uh, number ones. Chapter one, verse two. Hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. One ten, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. In chapter 2, verse 10, For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now, there are a couple of roles that are seen in those verses, but the common message in all three references is Christ as creator. Paul reminds us that it was by Christ that the heavens, the earth, and the worlds were made. And why is it important to understand Jesus in that role? You can tell a lot about an artist or a creator by what they create. So just look at the beauty and the diversity and the order of the world around us. And we can get some sense of the character and nature of Jesus Christ. One thing it teaches me about him, he loves us. To give us such an amazing, beautiful, and abundant world must mean that he cares an awful lot about us. People who love us are, are, are more apt to bestow us with valuable gifts. And then also in Genesis, at the end of each creative period, Christ pronounced that his work was good. Well, since we too are the products of that creation, we can rest assured that we are good. Man is not inherently bad or hopeless. We were created by a glorious being, and glory will be our final outcome if we follow the Creator. Because each of us is of infinite worth. Focusing on Christ as our Creator can help us to remember that. Number two, chapter 1, verse 3. Who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Chapter 1, verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Chapter 1, verse 13. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. We know that Jesus Christ holds a special position amongst all the spirit children of our heavenly parents. He represents the brightness of God's glory. And so like there's the sudden, the rays that come from it. So that's like Jesus's power. And the express image of his person. All that God does for this world is accomplished through and by his beloved son. That's why typically when we read an account of God visiting this earth, he usually simply points to Jesus and says, this is my beloved son, hear him. Jesus Christ is the father's right-hand man, so to speak. And together, along with the Holy Ghost, they lead and guide the plan of salvation and, and bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. So number twos are focusing on Christ's role as a member of the God. Number threes, chapter two, verse 17. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. 928. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And 10, 10 through 14. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. 
And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now these verses represent Christ in his role as our Redeemer. Without Christ, we would have no hope of being saved or returning back to our heavenly home. We would be forever subject to the powers of sin and death. He made reconciliation for the sins of the people. Remember, Christ is our mediator. Christ was offered to bear the sins of many. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Therefore, an important principle, through the atonement of Jesus Christ, we can be cleansed from sin and receive the promise of eternal life. And that truly is the miracle of Jesus Christ's sacrifice. I'm not sure that I completely understand how one man's suffering in a garden 2,000 years ago makes it possible for me to be forgiven of the bad choices that I've made throughout my life. But I do know that it works because I felt the power of that grace. He drank the bitter cup so that the bitterness of my sins can be made sweet. He suffered death so that my death will be but a temporary separation. He suffered pains, afflictions, and persecutions, so that my pains, afflictions, and persecutions will work for my good and bring me to glory. I know that my Redeemer lives. What comfort that sweet sentence gives. Now, number fours. Chapter 2, verse 18. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. 416. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And then 618 through 19. That by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. And this, this is perhaps one of my favorite messages about the Savior in the book of Hebrews. This is the Savior in his role as helper, a help in time of need. We don't need to walk the path of life alone. We have a source of strength and stability that, that is able to get us through all of our most difficult times. Jesus is able to succor those that are tempted. Now, succor is an interesting word. It's not a word that we really use anymore or in our everyday language. It comes from Latin. The root words for succor suggest running and help or rescue. In other words, Jesus suffered all these things, both temptation and trial, so that he would know how to run to help us. And he does. He does help us. And how is that help offered? Well, that can be offered in, in numerous ways, through inspired church leaders, through loving friends and family sent by God to help us. It can be offered through the scriptures, offered by actual angels sent from beyond the veil. It can be offered through the comforting presence of the Holy Ghost. But it can also be offered by an actual lifting, an easing of our burdens from, from Christ as a divine source. And I really love that metaphor in chapter 6. Our hope in Christ acts as an anchor to our souls. So what does an anchor do? It fastens us to the rock, keeps our boat steady, in the midst of the storms, the waves, and the winds of life. Jesus Christ and his promises provide us with strong consolation, refuge, and hope. And what do we hope for? Something better. Remember last week, that's the theme, that's the theme of the whole book. 
and ask you to pause and consider what truths or blessings are like an anchor of hope for you. One of mine? The promise of a better world. The world is a fairly evil and miserable place in a lot of ways. I can't wait until all that evil and misery and death are gone, leaving only the good and the beautiful behind. My hope for that kind of world keeps me going. It's an anchor. It's a help in time of need. So our truth here, we could just put it this way. Jesus Christ is the very Son of God, our Creator, our Redeemer, and our Help. To liken the Scriptures, what did you learn today about Jesus Christ that stands out most to you? It's just a simple, simple question. So I'd like to conclude this portion of the lesson by simply expressing my faith in Jesus Christ. I know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's my captain, my forerunner, my minister, my shepherd. He's the author and the finisher of my faith and a high priest of good things to come. I've been inspired and blessed by his creations. I felt the power of his redeeming love, and I've found help from him in times of need. I believe in Christ, and I love him for all that he's done for me. Now, another insight that I love from the book of Hebrews is what it teaches us about the principle of faith. Hebrews chapter 11 in particular has a lot to teach us about this first principle of the gospel. And so for an icebreaker, I like to show my students the following picture of the seven ancient wonders of the world, with one of them covered up. And, and what were the seven wonders of the ancient world? You've got the lighthouse of Alexandria, the mausoleum at Halicarnassus, the Colossus of Rhodes, the statue of Zeus at Olympia, the temple of Artemis, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. And then there's one more. And that last one holds a special place on that list because it's the only wonder of the ancient world that's still standing. All the rest have been reduced to rubble and ruin. But this wonder can still be visited today. And what's even more amazing is that this wonder is the oldest of the ancient wonders by far, by thousands of years even, can anyone name that last wonder? And the answer is the pyramids, the pyramids at Giza in Egypt. They're still standing nearly 5,000 years later. All of the others are basically gone, but the pyramids remain. And why is that? It's because the pyramid architecturally speaking, is amongst the strongest of structures that can be built by man. That particular design is far better equipped to withstand earthquakes, hurricanes, and even just the ravages of erosion and time. Pyramids are basically man-made mountains that can't be toppled or collapsed. And Egypt isn't the only place in the world where we see the persisting nature of pyramids. Ancient pyramids can also be found in Central America and Asia as well. It's a design that's been proven to last. Well, I love the pyramid as a symbol of faith. We want to have pyramid faith, a faith that is unshakable, untoppable, and unerodible. There are many forces out there in the world that are seeking to destroy and tear down our faith. But if we can build a pyramid of faith, well, then it can stand for eternity. Hebrews chapter 11 contains my hands down favorite definition of faith. It's found in verse one. And what I love so much about it, it are, are the words that Paul uses to describe the foundation upon which faith is built. They're words that I don't think we typically associate with faith. What are they? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, 
the evidence of things not seen. Isn't that those those good words? What's our faith founded on? Substance and evidence. Faith is based on substance and evidence. And if we go to the footnotes, we get another good word. The original Greek and the JST suggests the word assurance as an alternate translation to the word substance. Now, now why do I love that definition so much? For many years, I thought that my testimony was based on feelings. I know the church is true because I feel it. Now, feelings are important when it comes to faith. I'm not discounting. I know the church is true because I have felt powerful feelings as I've read the scriptures, listened to the prophets, or heeded the promptings of the Holy Ghost. But I don't think that you can base an entire testimony solely on feelings. Feelings are not the strongest of foundations. We want pyramid foundations. So what substance and assurance and evidence do we have? Lots. And let me just share three of those things with you. Uh, uh, One, experience. I know the church is true based on real life experiences that I've had. Answered prayers, miracles, priesthood declarations that have manifested themselves. And then just the real life blessings that have come into my life through obedience to the commandments. That's, that's not just feelings. And I could probably ask each of you, my listeners, of experiences that you've had that have helped you to know that God was real and that the church was true. And if you all sent me in those stories, uh, we could compile them all into one big book, which would be huge, a giant volume filled with thousands of stories which we could plop down in front of the the face of the skeptics and say, evidence, substance. How can you explain away all of these experiences, real life experiences of people? Coincidences? I don't think so. I also base my faith on reason. My sense of reason tells me that the church is true. I look at the world around me and up at the stars at night, and I consider the order and the majesty and the beauty of all of this creation. And my reason tells me there's something behind all that order. This cannot be one giant cosmic accident. There is a God. My reason tells me so. I flip through the pages of the Book of Mormon, and I read its contents with all of its literary historical, and spiritual complexity. And and I know that it exists. I mean, it's real. It's sitting right there in my hands as evidence, as substance. And my reason tells me, a 20-something-year-old farm boy with a third-grade education could not have written this. My reason tells me that. That's evidence. And then one more example. I believe the church is true based on authority. I may not have ever seen God or Jesus Christ, but I trust in the authority of those that say they have. Based on what I know about their character, I don't receive revelation to govern the church, but I believe in the authority of the 15 men that claim they do. So I look at their character, I listen to their words, and I realize, you know, if the church isn't true, they're going to know it. How could they claim to be receiving direct revelation from God if it's not really true, if it's not really happening. But but do I get the sense that they're trying to deceive me? Do I get the sense that they're motivated by greed or by power? Oh, and I could only speak for myself here, but they are good. They are sincere. They're righteous. They are self-sacrificing men. I trust in their authority. That's evidence. That's substance. So no, my faith is not based solely on my feelings, but I can add that to my pyramid as well. My feelings also confirm all of that substance, all of that evidence, and all of that assurance. All of this helps me to build a strong pyramid-like faith, which allows me to say, I know, or bear testimony of what I believe to be true. 
people of faith do, in fact, have strong legs to stand on. Yeah, that, that all of that evidence and substance is still based on things that are hoped for and not seen. But there is sure a lot of evidence and substance to back them up. Well, the rest of chapter 11 is a testament to the power and the enduring nature of faith. Paul is going to give us example after example of people from the Old Testament that demonstrated the power of faith in their lives. And like I said last week, you may have heard of the Hall of Fame, but here we have the Hall of Faith. So with a class of youth, I'd probably use this as an opportunity to play a bit of a review game to highlight some of the principles that are taught by the chapter. And one game that you could play is what I call a scripture animal race. It's kind of a fun way to cover a lot of material and move through the block of Scripture. And the way this works is, is that depending on the size of your class, you're going to divide them up into teams of two or three or four and give each one a small whiteboard. And they're also going to need a marker and something to erase it with. If you don't have whiteboards, they could use pieces of paper. But next, they'll need to decide on a team mascot or marker. And I just have these little cardstock animals that I print out and, and put a piece of magnet tape on the back. And I'll make a printout of some animals available with the handouts this week so that you can put this activity together if you like. I'm also going to provide a sheet with all the questions and answers that, that I ask uh, listed in one place. And then as a teacher, you can pick and choose which ones you wish to include in the activity, and you can come up with your own as you study the chapter and find your own insights. But on my whiteboard, I make a racetrack that looks like this. And I place each team's piece at the beginning. And then to play, you ask the class the questions from the block of scripture. And the team that can write the correct answer on their whiteboard first and raise it up in the air wins that round, wins that point. And their mascot gets to move forward two spaces on the track. But it doesn't end there. They also have to make two more choices. They have to choose another team to move forward one space with them. And they also get to choose a team to move back one space. And they can't choose their own mascot for this, of course, and, and they can't move the same team forward and then back again. It has to be two different teams. And the genius of that is that it keeps the teams fairly even on the track. Because if you have a team that dominates or a team that doesn't answer many questions, they still all seem to stay pretty even, since the winning team usually is the one that gets moved back, and the losing team is usually the one that gets moved forward. And it also creates a bit of fun and bargaining between the teams, as some beg to be moved forward and others moan about being moved back. The team that is in the lead by the final question wins. Just be sure to keep things lighthearted and fun. All right, uh, so that it doesn't become too competitive. Encourage them not to get too upset if they're the ones that are moved back a space uh, on occasion. It's just the name of the game. It's not personal. It's just business. So here are the questions and the answers that I would use accompanied by just a little bit of commentary. Question number one. What was the power by which the worlds were framed or created? The answer is in verse three by faith. I mean, this is the faith chapter, but I'm not sure that we always think of faith in that light. It's good to understand that faith is more than just a belief in something. It's also a principle of power. It's the means by which divine acts are accomplished. Even Jesus Christ worked by faith to create the world. Question number two, who are the two women of faith? that are mentioned by name in Hebrews chapter 11? Uh, the answer, Sarah, or Abraham's wife, who it says in verse 11, that she received strength to conceive a child even in her old age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Now that's an important verse of scripture because Genesis is a little unclear as to Sarah's attitude towards the Lord's promise of her bearing a child. Sometimes she's criticized because the scriptures say that she laughed when she heard the prophecy made. But it wasn't a laugh of disbelief. It was a laugh of rejoicing, 
of something too good to be true. She isn't an example of doubt, but a prime example of pyramid-like faith. She judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, she teaches us that faith can bring about the impossible. Miracles, even. With faith, even a 90-year-old woman can have a child. The other woman mentioned in chapter 11, Rahab in verse 31. And do you remember her story from last year? She was the woman of Jericho that hid the Israelite spies as they came in to possess the land. Now, Rahab stands out to me as one of the prime examples of faith, amazing faith in the scriptures. There were so many of the children of Israel themselves who had seen incredible miracles as they were freed from Egypt and made their way to Israel. The plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, manna from heaven daily, water from a rock. And they still struggled to trust in God or to have faith in Him. Rahab, on the other hand, saw none of those things. And yet, she believed. Just because she had heard that those things had happened. That's pyramid faith. That's believing in the evidence of things not seen. And because she did, she was saved. She was spared the fate of the rest of Jericho. If we can believe, like Rahab, without seeing, we too will be spared the fate of the rest of the world. Our walls won't come tumbling down. And then what was Rahab? She was a harlot, a prostitute. <laughs> Interesting that Paul chose to include a former prostitute in his list of most faithful people, the hall of faith, because faith can change people. Our past doesn't matter because faith frames our future. Perhaps that's why Paul chose to include her here. He himself had a similar story. He too had lived a very sinful former life, but faith transformed him and faith can transform us too. Question number three, in verses 1 through 10, be the first team to name the four people from the Old Testament that Paul points to as examples of faith. Answer, we have Abel, Enoch, Noah, and Abraham. Question number four, without faith, it's impossible to what? The answer is in verse six, it's impossible to please Faith is a requirement of discipleship. As we learn in the fourth article of faith, it's the first principle of the gospel. Question number five, God rewards what kind of people? Answer, verse six, he rewards those that diligently seek him. Question six, what three blessings did Noah's faith bring him? Answer, in verse seven, he was warned of things not seen yet. Because faith can protect us from future calamity. His house or his family was sick. Faith will do the same for us. And he became an heir of righteousness. Question number seven. Paul spends a lot of time on Abraham as an example of faith from verses 8 through 19. We looked at a lot of those verses last week, so, so we're not going to spend as much time on them here. But the big idea is that Abraham left his city and country and sought for a better See that in verse 16. But here's the question. How did he seek that country? He went out. How? Answers in verse 8. He went out not knowing whither he went. And that's faith. Acting without knowing. Faith is a principle of action. We have to believe enough to do something trusting that God will guide and reward us for that action. The world says just the opposite. They say, I'll believe it when I see it. But God says, you'll see it once you believe it and act on it first. Question number eight. In this chapter, Paul gives us an interesting detail about Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac. One of the reasons he was willing to do it was because he had faith that God could do what? Verse 19, 
that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead. We don't get that detail back in the Old Testament. But Abraham believed that even if he did sacrifice Isaac, that God had the power to bring him back to life. That's faith. God had already shown Abraham by the birth of Isaac that even the impossible was possible. So why not in death as well? With God, nothing is impossible. And the more experiments of faith that we do and the results that we see will give us stronger and stronger faith. Question number nine. Faith prompted Moses to make what decision in his life? Answer. And this is a detail which is unclear about Moses in the Old Testament. In the Exodus account of Moses' life, it seems that the reason Moses leaves Egypt for Midian is because of the, the incident of the killing of the taskmaster and that he ran away out of fear. Not so, according to Paul. Moses, by faith, chose to leave behind the riches and the power and the pleasures of Egypt, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God instead. He esteemed the reproach of Christ greater than all the riches of Egypt. And that's saying something. I have actually seen uh, some of the riches of Egypt. And I went to, when I went to Egypt, I, I went to the Egyptian museum and saw the incredible treasures of Tutankhamun's tomb. So much gold. Uh, beautiful, beautiful treasures. Moses left all of that behind because he realized that God provided a greater reward than all of that. He forsook Egypt by choice, by, by faith. And that's a significant message there. Our faithful decisions may not lead immediately to blessing and ease and reward. In fact, they very well may lead us to harder conditions and greater challenges, like Moses suffered. But in the end, that decision led to a far greater recompense from God. We too, like Moses, can choose to forsake the things of this world and bear the reproach of Christ in faith that a greater reward than the riches of Egypt awaits us. Question number 10. Name five more people that are examples of faith that haven't been mentioned yet. Answer. They could write Isaac, Jacob, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Japheth, David, and Samuel. Although I do argue a little bit with Samson there. I'm not sure why Paul includes him, unless, unless there's something about Samson I don't know. But I, I just don't see Samson as a hero of faith when you really read his story. So I, I don't know what to say about that. But question number 11, name three things Paul mentioned that people were able to do through the power of faith. And they could write down all kinds of things from the chapter to answer that question. But I'll just focus in on verses 33 through 35 where Paul makes a giant list of incredible things that people were able to accomplish through faith. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. So, just look at all the kinds of things that faith can do. We too can receive those types of blessings, accomplish incredible, amazing, miraculous things through the power of our faith in God. But, question 12, we can't just look at all those miracles and good things that came to pass. There's another important lesson about faith that Paul wants us to understand. Name three of the trials that people suffered because of their faith. And again, there's a lot in the chapter that they can mention, but specifically, let's look at 36 through 38. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not 
worthy. <laughs> I love that little phrase. The, the world itself was not worthy of the character of these people. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. So, what's the message of faith there? Faith does not assure us ease, protection, or instant reward. People of faith do and will suffer. They will be persecuted and maybe even lose their lives as the result of their faith. That's, that's important to keep in mind. So that when those kinds of things happen, we won't get discouraged and we won't abandon our faith in those tough circumstances. However, our last question here, 13, using the JST, what does Paul want us to know about those that do suffer because of their faith? Check out the footnotes for this one. Here's how Paul concludes this chapter all about faith. God having provided some better things for them through their sufferings, for without sufferings, they could not be made perfect. Those that suffer in faith will be provided with better things in the end. And they'll be made perfect through their sufferings. Faith always leads to better things. Anything that we lose because we decide to demonstrate faith will be more than made up to us in the end. And that that's, that's all the questions that we'll cover from this chapter. But I hope that gave us all a deeper comprehension of the importance and the nature of faith. And two great like in the scriptures questions that you might consider uh, concluding this activity with? Who else would you include in your own personal hall of faith? And how are they examples to you of the power of faith? Maybe it's a sibling, a, a parent, a grandparent, an ancestor, a teacher, a, a, a leader, somebody that you would include in your own personal hall of faith. And then what personal experiences would you include from your own life? What things have you been able to accomplish? What blessings, what miracles have you seen in your own life through the power of your faith? And I hope, I hope that our study of this chapter has strengthened and fortified all of your personal pyramids. The message is clear. Faith is power. It is a force to be reckoned with. Paul just gave us example after example of the miraculous, real-world kinds of things that faith can accomplish. In a world that seems to be all about proof, tangibility, scientific method, it's nice to be reminded how potent faith can be. Paul just gave us an entire chapter of substance, evidence, and assurance of the power of faith. And I pray that, that we've all been able to think of some examples from our own lives, of our own substance and evidence that we could add to this list made by Paul. May our faith be the kind of faith that will stand for millennia, like the pyramids of old. And that'll conclude our lesson for this week, my friends. Thank you, thank you so much for spending this time with me this week. I, I hope it blessed you. Uh, I hope it helped you in some way. If it did, please consider sharing the channel with somebody that, that you feel it could help. Uh, teachers, if you're interested in the resources, uh, in the game materials, uh, the crossword puzzle, uh, just go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find uh, links to those resources so that you, you could get those. Well, I, I hope that you'll join me again next week. Thank you so much for watching. Now get out there and teach with power.